This is Expat Sandwich. I'm Marty Walker. When they drove me to the station, they they drove up the back garage area of the police station and they they put a bulletproof vest, they draped it over me. The police got out of the car and, and searched the rooftops before they pulled me out of the car and hustled me into the station. I think they thought, like, if I was trying to sell to some mafia people, that they would try to silence me before I could talk. That's Mike Martino. He grew up in New Mexico and Texas, and he's currently a potter living in Japan. His path has been anything but linear. There's a 500-year-old Japanese pottery technique called kintsugi, which translates as golden rejoining. It's used on broken pots, bowls, and cups. Pieces are rejoined and cracks are filled in with a mixture of gold and lacquer. And even though it's predominantly a visual technique, kintsugi focuses on the life rather than the look of a pot. Think of the fractures on a ceramic bowl as not signifying the end of its life, but more as marking essential moments in its history with golden significance. This is his story. My name is Mike Martino, and um, I'm living in Taku, Japan, which is about the middle of Saga Prefecture, which is on the western side of the island of Kyushu. It's about as country as you get around here. I mean, the the 20,000 people or 18 or whatever it is now is pretty spread out over a large area. And um, it used to be a coal mining town, and it was a sort of a boom town. And this was back in the like the, the 50s. So at its peak, the population was about 50,000 people. And then the coal mine shut down, and it's been slowly, steadily shrinking ever since. When it was 50,000 people, it got designated as a city by the government of Japan. And now it, the population actually is such that they don't downgrade them after they've been given the designation of city. So it's Japan's smallest city, actually. This was Mike's second move to Japan after previously moving back to Dallas. When we came back to Japan this time, uh, I did interview for jobs in Tokyo, actually because I used to be in software, and I was looking for a software job, and that was where they all are. But I quickly realized when I did a couple of interviews that it was going to be sort of the, what we see in the West as the stereotypical sort of Japanese businessman sort of bit, you know, wearing wearing the suit every day and going in at the crack of dawn and then coming back after dark. And we had, we had our kids at the time were, two years old and six months old. And I wanted to see my kids grow up. So, uh, and I, and, and honestly, if you've ever been to Tokyo, there's so many people there. Um, on one hand, it's a really nice place to visit, but I wouldn't want to live there. So we scrapped that plan and we came out to the country. (laughs) It's not a big piece of land. It's probably a third of an acre or something like that. We've got our house and I've got my studio and my kiln here. Taku is located in the Karatsu region of Saga Prefecture, which a prefecture is like a state um, within the country of Japan. And back in the day, it was a trading port with China and Korea. And the pottery there is influenced by Korean clay and glazing techniques and is referred to as Karatsu ware. It's like an earthenware and really known for its simple rustic beauty. The larger pieces are usually um, coiled, you know, built by coiling and hand building and stuff like that because the clay is hard to work with here. So um, when you look back at the historical pieces, the 
you know, bowls and, and, and small things are usually thrown, but bigger things are usually hand built. You know, normally clay is really plastic and that allows people to do things with it, like stretch it and it have it keep its shape. But the clay around here, this whole region, there's a lot of clay, but it's all really sandy, large particle. And it's what we call in pottery, it's what we call short clay, which means it has no plasticity. It's also uh, related to the types of materials. Sometimes it's not even clay. Sometimes it's like sandstone that's been pounded down or something, some kind of rock that's been pounded down, in which case it's not even clay. So you really can't, you can't throw big with it um, unless you're really, really, really good. And some, some, some of the older pieces, I, I, I am amazed that they could do what they did with it, but you know, they were master craftsmen. So the gas kiln is probably half a cubic meter of volume inside. And I can fill it up. I can make stuff and fill it up in a couple days. And the wood kiln holds 20 times as much as the gas kiln, maybe more. So I spend a couple of months, two or three months making work and loading the kiln. And during this time, until now, I've been chopping wood. I get these uh, milled cutoffs from a place. It's, it's Douglas fir and there's these, so it's these blocks of wood. Traditionally, around here, they use red pine to fire the kilns, and there's various reasons for that. Um, the pine has a lot of pitch in it, and it's got a, so it's got a lot of calories, and it burns fairly quickly, but it leaves ash, and, and the flame is quite long, so it reaches back into the kiln, as opposed to like, you know, oak or some of these hardwoods, they'll burn hot, and they'll leave ash, but they the flame does not extend back very far so that's one thing that's one reason pine is is preferred i've usually got a pretty good ember bed going in the bottom so i start stoking from the stoke hole and i'll stoke fairly large pieces like four inches square by three feet long maybe 15 or 16 of those will go in in one stoke and just let it burn for 30 minutes and then let it burn down and then stoke again every 30 minutes. And I'll do that for a couple days. Which, if you're like me, you might be wondering by this time, if you're stoking a fire for 48 hours straight, when do you get any sleep? We used to have three people and we'd sort of take shifts and we'd, you know, take turns sleeping. But always at the end of three days, we were always exhausted. And then a couple firings ago, we discovered this new thing that, well, okay, let's just set the timer after we stoke and sleep for 25 minutes and then wake up and stoke again. And we're still fresh after, at the end of the firing. It, it works really well. The reason I fire for three days, I wouldn't need to fire for three days. The temperature of the kiln can get up to the temperature that will melt the glazes in 24 hours. But... The temperature difference is so drastic from top to bottom and front to back that um, I, I do the three-day firing because I need that heat to soak into everything and even out. So when you finish with a firing, you can't just open the door and take the objects out of the kiln. You've got to let it cool down slowly so the pieces don't crack. Oh, God, it's so slow. It's torture. It's Oh my God, it's torture. The gas kiln cools off in a, in a day and a half to two days. And the wood kiln takes five days to cool off. It takes a week. If you've ever taken a ceramics class or been involved in making pottery, you're probably familiar with what's referred to as the kiln gods. So many things can go wrong with a firing. Like maybe a piece wasn't dry enough and explodes in the kiln, causing the shards of pottery to stick into the melting glazes of all the other pots around it. Or a glaze just doesn't perform as you thought it would. There's really no way to see what's going on in there because you can't let the heat escape by opening the door. I usually get pretty uh, active with the hammer after each firing. 
I'd say 30% just gets hammered outright when we unload. It's sort of paving gravel for our driveway. So how do you go from working in software to becoming a potter? I was doing software localization and quality assurance. We would work on these projects. At the end of the development cycle, you, you know, your job was done. Um, and then you just started the next development month cycle on something else or the next version of what you had just worked on. And there was never anything, to me, never anything really that tangible that I had spent my time working on. There was, like, there was nothing lasting that came of it. Although I have to admit the paycheck was nice. But as a potter, you know, when you, you spend time working on things and when you come up with something good, you know it's going to last hundreds or thousands of years if it's taken care of right. When we were still in Dallas and I was looking for a job in the computer industry, I also thought about starting a side business selling Japanese pottery in America. So I contacted a couple of uh, studios in Japan asking them if they were interested. In the course of that, I emailed back and forth with this guy who was not a porcelain potter, but a, a stoneware, earth, you know, stoneware potter in the Karatsu tradition. We emailed back and forth, and then at one point, when we came, when my wife and the kids and I came to Japan to visit her parents, I went to this guy's studio and met him and spoke with him. And it was, I was still thinking about the business of exporting, and uh, I saw him work a bit, and I thought, wow, that's really interesting. And then. Before I could get the business going in Dallas, we decided to move back here. I sort of would go by his studio a couple times a week and watch him work and ask him questions. And then I started trying things out on my own. And, and it was a hobby for me for a few years. And I really liked the idea of doing something that has been transmitted down through the generations. It's just really appealing to me that you can go up to the mountain, you can dig a rock or a lump of dirt out of the side of the hill and turn it into something that is not only functional, but beautiful as well. And then I got invited to a show and I did a show when a lot of things sold. And I, if I was getting it out in front of people where they could see it, a lot of people would buy it. And I thought maybe this is something that I could do. And so it kind of developed from there. At this point, I had just assumed Mike had gotten a degree in computer science and taken some art classes along the way. Not even close. I started out as a music major, a jazz major. I wanted to be a musician, but um, <laughs> I just didn't have the talent for it. I, the, the people that were there were so phenomenal. It was just, uh, I don't want to say intimidating, it was, but it was a reality check. In retrospect, I might still be in music if I had gone to a music school that wasn't so good. The University of North Texas College of Music has one of the top, if not the top jazz program in the world. It's amazing. They walked around the dorms with their instruments hanging around their necks. You'd hear them practicing in the bathrooms, you know. And I knew at that point that I didn't want to practice that much to become a musician. So I, I only lasted a couple of years. And then I changed to anthropology, and that was what I got my degree in. I kind of got into anthropology because I've always liked uh, the archaeological side of things was sort of how to, that got me into it. I, mean, I grew up in New Mexico around Santa Fe, and we, we spent a lot of times going around to, you know, uh, like Bandelier National Monument, Mesa Verde, and, you know, places like that. And um, at the time in Santa Fe, you know, you could go under bridges at the edges of town and you could find arrowheads and, and mortars and pestles and, and stone, other stone tools and things like that. Mike would go on to graduate from UNT with a degree in anthropology and two semesters of Japanese under his belt. I knew I wanted to go to Japan and maybe learn Japanese and do karate, and that was it. I think I forgot to mention, Mike's a second-degree black belt. And so that was my short-term goal. And then after that, one thing sort of led to another. I remember at, like, the nine-month mark, I woke up in the morning... And I was in a horrible mood. I don't know what it was. I just felt like crap. You know, I was grouchy and I was annoyed and I just had it. I was fed up. I don't know how to describe it. It was just that my entire existence just, I was tired of it. And um, 
I just, I came just so close to uh, booking a ticket and leaving. Hitting the wall is a real thing for expats. New Zealand immigration has created a settlement index, which shows the emotional peaks and valleys you experience from moving abroad. Months 9 through 18 are full of frowny faces, and then it picks back up. And I made it past that, and after that, everything was great, everything was fine. Ask anybody, and they'll tell you that learning to speak the language in another country can be brutal. Most advise to park your ego at the door. I asked Mike to share some of his memorable and humbling language mishaps. In the parks in the summertime, they have these shaved ice places, like a snow cone sort of thing. And it's called Kucky Gordy, uh, which literally means shaved ice. Um, at the time, and I'd only been there like two weeks, so I only had a few words in my vocabulary. And one of the words in my vocabulary was Gokiburi, which is different than Kakigori. Gokiburi, Kakigori. But they sort of have the similar rhythm to them, I guess. Kakigori is shaved ice. Um, Gokiburi is cockroach. I walked up to this stand, and there was probably, it was this maybe like young college girl, maybe high school girl uh, doing a part-time job or something like that. And I walked up and I said, can I have one cockroach, please? <laughs> and, of course, I didn't realize I was making the mistake, right? And she just stared at me. She just, literally, her mouth was not quite, her mouth didn't quite drop open, but she just looked at me like, oh, God. Like a doe caught in the headlights, sort of. And there was no response, and I, so I thought, okay, she didn't hear me, so I you know, can I have one cockroach, please, again? And she was just looking at me, and then, and then somebody comes up behind her and just kind of says something to her, and she says something to them, and, and so they, they got one of the shaved ice, you know, things, and they put some of the juice on it, and they handed it to me, and I paid them and said, thank you, and they said, you're welcome, and I walked off, uh, and I thought, well, that was, and I remember at the time, I was, I didn't realize I'd made the mistake, so I was just thinking, God, that was really weird, where they just kind of freaked out because a foreigner walked up to them, or like, what's going on here? And I literally, like, in the middle of the night, that night, I woke up, and I was thinking, Goki Birdy Kaki, oh shit! <laughs> it, it took like 10 hours for me to realize the mistake. One other time, I walked into a, uh, it was a building lobby in, in the middle of town, and it was in the morning. And so the uh, the guy was in there buffing the floors of this uh, marble-floored lobby. And there were signs that said, do not step on the clean floor, you know. I started walking across, you know, and he stops and goes, get off the floor, you know. And I, I couldn't really understand what he said, said, but I could tell he wasn't happy, and then he was shooing me off his floor. And so, not wanting to be rude... I wanted to say sumimasen, which is I'm sorry, or gomen nasai, which is I'm sorry, but I was kind of freaked out and uh, and I kind of panicked. And so as I backed away bowing, I was saying, good morning, good morning, good morning. Uh, I was saying ohayou gozaimasu to him. <laughs> that, one I real, that one I realized, you know, like five minutes later, I was like, oh, man. And, and who, who knows what he was thinking, you know? <laughs> Once you get past the stage of feeling self-conscious about speaking in a foreign language, you'll be amazed at the acceleration of learning, especially when you're immersed in it, like every single day. So the fourth year I was here, I got into a, an intensive Japanese language school. I went there for a year, and it was every day for four hours a day. That was when I started learning a lot of reading and writing. My conversation was pretty close to fluent for conversational Japanese, but I needed to learn reading and writing much, much better. At that point, I decided I wanted to try and get into university. And then some news that stopped him in his tracks. It turns out I have a heart arrhythmia. I mean, it's not like one of those ones where you just suddenly drop dead or anything like that. Having it happen in a foreign country where I couldn't 
I couldn't communicate well with the doctors and they, and as it turns out now, I realized I was going to a doctor who didn't really do his job. I was a bit panicked about what was happening and it kind of freaked me out enough to, to make me quit strenuous physical activity for a while. Mike would go on to get a master's degree in comparative culture at Kyushu University. This is where he'd meet his wife. Meeting the parents is a little trickier in another culture. My wife, she didn't actually make it easy because <laughs> she didn't tell them about me. Basically, she was she was afraid to tell them about me. She had never taken a boyfriend home to meet her parents or anything like that. Her dad had jokingly said on a couple occasions, he said, yeah, oh, just, bring, you know, I don't care, you know, some some blue-eyed guy, it's fine, it's okay, just, you know, we want to know that you're dating someone. And so when we graduated with, a, you know, we were graduating, and her parents expected her to go on and get a doctorate and then teach at the university in Saga and take care of them in their old age. When she tells them that we're dating, she doesn't just tell them we're dating. She says, I'm dating this guy. Um, oh, he's American. Um, oh, um, I'm not planning to go ahead and get my doctorate because... Uh, we're going to get married <laughs> and, and, uh, we're going to move to Dallas. <laughs> so, you know, to be fair to her parents, that's a lot to swallow in one take, isn't it? I wasn't there when she made the announcement, thankfully. But anyway, there was quite, apparently quite the explosion happening. So they didn't even want to meet me. They were like, don't even bother bringing him. I was pretty good friends with my landlord. He decided to play mediator. And so he contacted her parents and arranged for me to go to their house um, with, and meet the family, basically. Uh, that actually smoothed things over quite a bit. So after that first meeting, we sort of had her dad on my side. And her dad was, you know, her dad cracked pretty quick. He was, he's always been the easygoing one. And her mom, her mom held out for a few years, I think. If her parents have anything negative to say about me, they don't say it to me. They say it to my wife. And then she gets caught in the middle, sort of. For them, it's like to say something directly to me would be impolite or rude or something like that. If you think marriage and relationships are hard, having a partner from another culture pushes things into a whole other dimension. As much as you think you know going into it about the different cultures and everything, it's not even close. I'm still finding things. We've been married nearly 20 years now, and um, I'm, I'm still finding stuff where we miscommunicate, you know, and then... It takes a minute for one or the other of us to realize that we're miscommunicating. And it's not just verbal communication, it's nonverbal communication and what you're, what you're saying without saying anything and not even realizing it. Mike landed a job with a software company in Dallas. They would spend the next five years starting their family and raising two boys. We spoke only Japanese in the household because we wanted the kids to learn Japanese. And uh, then after we moved back to Japan, which was in 2002, we switched to English only in the household because we wanted the kids to keep their English. During all of grade school here, for both the boys, there were there was several years of of outright rebellion. You know, not wanting to speak English. You know, they'd go to school every day, every day, all day was Japanese. In the morning and the evenings was English, and so they were more comfortable speaking Japanese by far. My pet phrase for like six or seven years there was, you know, me yelling across the living room or yelling from the kitchen or yelling from upstairs, guys, speak English, you know. And then they went from chattering happily to utter silence, you know, downstairs. And then 
And then I hear, you know, I hear, you know, hear whispering in Japanese, you know. So. <laughs> after five years in Dallas, Mike was laid off. They moved back to Japan. And shortly after they arrived, something truly insane happened. I woke up one morning and there were three police cars and a couple of other cars parked on our property and armed police with bulletproof vests knocking on our door. And they came in and they arrested me and hauled me off to like a five or six hour drive to Kobe where they tossed me in jail. I get there at 11 something, 12 something at night, right? Everybody's already supposed to be asleep, but there's a drunk in one of the cells. He was a homeless guy who was drunk and they, they brought him in to dry him out overnight. The lights are out. He's up, he's at the bars. We walk in and I hear him. He's in speaking Japanese, but he's like, hey, um, I'm ready to go home now. <laughs> you know, and he's just yelling. Okay, I'm good, I'm ready. I, I think I'll, ha I'll go and I'm ready to have something to drink and go home. You know, he would not shut up. And so as they march me over to the cell next door to his, and there's one guy awake there too, he's pacing back and forth and he's yelling, <laughs> old man, you know, if you don't shut up, I'm going to fucking rip your tongue out. I'm going to, I'm going to get over there. I'm going to strangle you. <laughs> you know, basically threatening to kill this guy. And then he's in the cell. They're about to put me into and I'm like, holy shit, what are you doing? Right. <laughs> and so I, they put me in there and say, okay, you sleep there. And they talk to you. They go, you shut up, go to bed. Right. And so I laid, I, you know, I just lay down in the bed. I'm like, I hope this guy doesn't try to like kill me in my sleep or something like that. We wake up in the morning, everybody gets up, and the guy that was yelling the night before, he was like, oh, hey, uh, what's your name? I tell him my name. He goes, oh, I'm, you know, so-and-so. Hey, I'm, I'm really sorry about last night. That guy wouldn't shut up, and I was so pissed off. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry you had to hear that. <laughs> and so everybody introduces themselves. Um, there was an old guy in there, like 70. He was a con man, apparently. And then there was a younger guy in there who was also a con man. And then there was another younger guy in there who was in for, like, stealing a car stereo or something. And they gave me the best piece of advice um, that entire time. They said, no matter what they do, do not admit to something that you didn't do. So they said, you know, they'll do everything they can to get a confession out of you. They'll try every trick in the book, you know, aside from beating you. And... So if you didn't do it, do not confess to it, because once your fingerprint is on that statement, you can't change it. To be honest, to be fair, it was, it was my fault. <laughs> um, so when we came to Japan, we only brought half our stuff with us. And then when we built this house, we decided to bring over the other half of our stuff. And in the other half of our stuff, I had completely forgotten about the two bricks of 22 caliber bullets that I had in a box somewhere. Hey, what can I say? I was living in Texas. I had remembered, thankfully, oh my God, thankfully, I had remembered to take my two handguns and send them to my dad before we moved back here. And so this police come in, uh, they show up at the front door at 6 a.m. in the morning to catch us before we were awake, you know, and they put me in handcuffs and say, we're arresting you because you are importing, you're, you've imported uh, bullets with the intent to sell them on the black market in Japan. So they drove me up to Kobe. And the reason it was Kobe was because that was the port where the freighter came in that had our container of stuff. 
And that was where the customs people found the bullets. So I got tossed in a jail cell. It was a small room that four of us stayed in. So I got pulled out of that room every morning by the police where we went downstairs to the interrogation room where they took my statement, basically asked me questions and wrote out my statement until lunchtime, which at that time they were required to take me back up to the cells so that I could eat lunch. And then after lunch, they would pull me out again and finish the interrogation. And then they had to have me back by 6 p.m. or something like that. They wrote down anything I said, wrote it up into a statement every day. Every day when we'd finish up, they would, they would read back to me what they had written. And I would approve it or pick something out of it that I didn't agree with and have them correct it. And then once we both agreed on what was in the statement, then I would sign my thumbprint to it and that would be sent or to wherever. And uh, the district attorney prosecutor would look at it, I guess. In the U.S., the police have to let you go after holding you for 24 hours if they aren't able to charge you with a crime. In Japan, they can hold you for 21 days without charging you. For 18 days uh, before the DA decided to toss it out because it, it was obvious it was an oversight. I even, when they came to my house, they, they confiscated my computer and they searched through all the emails and everything like that. And what they found in the emails were being aware that guns were not legal in Japan and sending the guns back to my dad and things like that. So the one thing, and this is interesting, this is a big cultural difference here, is they said, why do you need to have so many bullets? And I told them, I said, look, those are 22 bullets. They're sold in bricks. It's a brick of 500 bullets. Cost maybe 16, 17 bucks. And they didn't believe me. They thought I was lying. And it took them a few days, but after like three or four days later, they came back with a report on the, the state of affairs of ammo sales in the United States or something like that. And, you know, it showed you know, places like Walmart and sporting goods stores with these bricks of 22 bullets stacked up like cans of corn, you know, on sale. And uh, they said, and they, at, at that point, they actually said, we really thought you were lying about this, but it looks like you weren't. <laughs> because the only people that have guns here are the police and the mafia have a few. And so they probably thought I was going to try to sell to some mafia people. They wouldn't let me talk to an attorney for the first few days. They wouldn't let me talk to the consulate for the first few days. Um, so I was just dangling in the wind. And then finally I was able to see the consulate and the guy from the consulate, he actually snickered because he knew the situation about bullets and such. And, and he said, okay, he said, just, just hang in there. In a few days, they'll realize what's up and they'll, they'll let it go. And then I also hired a lawyer. He said, yeah, I'm pretty sure they're going to let this go just from hearing what you said. But now that you've hired a lawyer and it's fairly clear you're not just going to roll over and let them uh, steamroll you, that we'll get them to let it go. And so after I had the lawyer at the consul advice, I felt a lot better. But the police wouldn't let it go. It's like... It's like they had spent all this money to drive their team of guys down to get me and bring me back up. And then I talked to the lawyer about that, and he said, well, also there's this to consider. He said, the guy in charge of the investigation, his bonus is based on how many people get convicted. And I can look back on it now and laugh, but at the time, it definitely was not funny. Speaking of funny, I asked Mark to explain Japanese comedy. It just always seems so over the top to me. I think that what, what Japanese people find funny and what American people find funny is often quite different. 
Well, like if you're watching TV, a lot of the humor is really slapstick. And so my wife and my kids, they'll be laughing at something and I'll be like, I don't see why that's funny. You know, you know like stand-up comedy, you know, in the, in the States, I think stand-up comedy is a fairly big thing, right? You know, where it's a one one person standing in front of a crowd of people and telling jokes. Here, that's just not that common. Here, there's something called bonsai. It's two guys or ladies or a combination of one or two. It's anyway, it's a pair of people who riff off of each other. And that's the routine. Downtown is a comedy duo consisting of Hitoshi Matsumoto and Mazatashi Hamada. They've been around since 1982 and are considered one of Japan's most influential and prolific manzai comedians working today. Here's a clip. I think, like as in so many other things in Japanese culture, even this manza, even this is very codified in the way that it's done. Um, so there's, there's one person that sort of is the foil for all of the jokes, and then one person who sort of uh, is the one who tells the, you know, sort of starts the jokes or hits or hits the punchlines and things like that. And sometimes it's really clever, and sometimes it's just this slapstick stuff that I just don't get. I asked Mike to share the things he misses most about the U.S. I've been wanting to tell somebody this for a while. I never used to eat McDonald's before. Even though I had only eaten them like once in my life previously, I would get these sudden inexplicable cravings for McDonald's french fries. But the thing that I really miss, I, I like, you know, all kinds of, you know, the stinky cheese and weird cheese, you know, I love that stuff. 15 years ago, you couldn't get it anywhere. Now you can get it some places. Uh, good cheese is starting to arrive in Japan, but it, 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 it's worth its weight in gold, literally. And then also the other thing that I really like are good, you know, spicy Italian sausages and things like that. They have some people, you know, some art, artisanal cheese and sausage and, and, you know, foreign food smokers and things like that. They have these artisanal places throughout Japan where people have started these small businesses. But again, of anything else in Japan, the cost of labor costs more than anything else. So anything you buy that's produced here costs a lot to begin with anyway. A lot of people experience profound change when they leave their native country. I asked Mike how living in Japan has changed him. I had to say, F it and just be more outgoing. That was a major change right there. Yeah, that was a big difference for me as far as trying to just say the hell with it and sort of put myself out there. That was something I never did before. The other thing was speaking my opinion as an American. You know, Americans are, if nothing else, they tell you what they think, right? And here... People try and read where the conversation is going and try not to kick up any dust. You know, so if somebody disagrees with you, unless it's someone who's like a really good friend of yours or something like that, who will probably tell you that they disagree or, oh, what about this? Maybe this would be good too. Uh, most people will just go along. Uh, people don't contradict you openly here, mostly. You know, if I heard somebody say that something that I knew was flat out wrong, rather than correcting them, I would just let it go. Because if I didn't, then I was, I was the dick, right? For creating the sort of, this sort of um, tension in the conversation. Although I have to say that if it's just two people, if you know each other pretty well and it's just the two of you, you know, you can disagree with each other, it's okay. But, you know, then when there's a third or a fourth or a fifth person there, that whole dynamic, you know, sort of contradicting somebody and embarrassing them from, in front of other people or something like that, that, that would be something that's probably not a good thing to do. So what's become more apparent to me now is there's the Japanese, you know, it's what they say, and then there's the subtext, and then there's the, the body language and all this, which I re I'm realizing now, even after it's almost 20 years, 
I'm fairly clueless to a lot of the body language and the um, this sort of nonverbal communication. I'm, I'm at a bit of a disadvantage because even when I'm in the States, I'm a fairly I'm fairly easy to read as far as what the looks on my face and my reactions to things. So here I must be like, you know, an open book to everyone. You know, <laughs> they probably know what I'm thinking before I even know what I'm thinking. You know, if they if they do nothing else well in Japan, it's it's boy, you know how to read a room. I tell you. One thing I've become more aware of now that I try and focus on more is the movements of people's eyes and where they're looking and how wide they are open and such, or the rigidness of someone's spine or, you know, their neck or something like that. And by no means, I'm not really good at, you know, at reading it yet, but at least now that I'm paying attention, I think I notice a, a, a bit more. But, you know, often we'll say, oh, you know, if, you know, people look you in the eye, you can kind of trust what they're saying or... In the, in, the, in the States, but here, often people don't look you in the eye no matter what. Staring somebody in the eyes is, is kind of considered rude. On a couple occasions, I'd, I'd caught someone's look and I'd looked back at them. And if it's a young guy, you know, that's sort of, that's, that's aggressive behavior. If it's two young guys, you know, kind of staring at each other, refusing to look away, that's sort of, that's aggressive behavior. And finally... I'm always curious to know what expats are reading. When I'm reading for basically what I would call like work-related or research stuff, a lot of the material that I can read about karatsu and history and everything like that is in Japanese. When I'm reading just for fun, you know, um, I'm reading English books. One of the most interesting books that I read, and it didn't pertain specifically to Japan, but it, it was sort of a heads up. In this book was the concept of the marginal man. It was a fairly uh, well-known book about the acquisition of culture and the loss of culture and the reacquisition of culture and that process. So for example, someone moving, leaving their country and moving to another country and, and becoming acculturated to this new country, and losing their acculturation, the deculturation of their where their home country, you know, and and then um, it talked about the possibility that someone you know could not integrate properly enough into the new culture and lose enough of their old culture so that they become marginalized between the two, sort of cultural purgatory, and not really feel at home completely in either culture. And that was the concept of marginal, marginal man. And uh, I remember at the time, that was when I was in my first seven years in Japan. And so that, that applied in many ways to what I was experiencing. And I remember at that time working really hard to try to acculturate to Japanese culture because of that. I didn't want to be sort of, like if I stayed in Japan a long time, I didn't want to always feel uncomfortable and an outsider in Japanese culture. That's going to wrap it up for us. If you want to find Mike Martino and check out his pottery on the interwebs, you can find him at karatsupots.com. That's K-A-R-A-T-S-U-P-O-T-S dot com. He's also offering his wares on Etsy. And a big thank you to our Patreon supporters, Louise Walker, Tim Hurst, and Jay Shin, and at Honorable Husband. And like always, we'll have all of this and more in our show notes on our website at expatsandwich.com. Expat Sandwich is produced by me, Marty Walker. I'll see you back here in a couple weeks. 